Hi, I'm Dan Linstead, and today I'm going to be talking to you about RapidGen DS, my new company, in partnership with Analytics DS and Mapping Manager. Our job with RapidGen DS is to provide common reusable code gen libraries for Analytics DS Mapping Manager. We also provide custom code gen libraries, so if you see something you would love to have, you don't have the time to create it, and you want you want it fully supported out of the box, give us a call uh, through Analytics DS, and we'll be able to meet your needs. Today's demo, or this particular demo, we're going to show you how to call RapidGen DS libraries to generate Data Vault 2.0 SQL for SQL Server. Okay, welcome back. We're in Analytics DS Mapping Manager version 4.6 and I'm going to show you a couple of the maps that we have going on for Data Vault 2.0 and then I'll walk you through the code generation. So one of the first maps is loading stage. In this particular case what we are doing is we're loading from a relational database engine SQL Server to a relational database stage table. So this is very focused. We can use views for this. And we've got a couple of functions that we apply in Data Vault 2.0. The first one is a hash. And in this particular case, we've built a business rule, which we can repeat on different fields that we want to have a hash. In this case, we want to hash key. And in this case, we want to hash difference. And so that's what the H stands for. Now, the code generation relies on target table class, target column class, uh, and it also relies on the type of element that you, that you put, and it also relies on the business rules, if you have any. So that said, what we've got here is a couple of things. We've got a staging table target, so everything's labeled STG, and we have a target column class H key for hash key, LDTS for load date, RSRC for record source, and you get the idea. So the rest of this is marked. We have actually marked the business key twice. We've marked it with B key, and we've also marked it with a target business key flag, as you can see here. Now, when we come over to the source side of the map, you can see we've got a couple of different things going on. The first thing that we have is a source environment name and a source system name. We've labeled these SYS because in our code generation scripts, we detect SYS as source columns, and we say, hey, wait, these are actually system generated. So in this particular case, we've needed a unique source column name to satisfy the tool requirements. So we've added SRC comp hash. Now we could, we could call this Timbuktu and it really wouldn't matter. But the point is, is that we take the value or the hard coded value or what's here and we pump it in through the function and we end up generating the proper code downstream. So without further ado, let's walk you right into the code generation for source to target. And in this case, let's talk about uh, source to stage. So we've got some code gen here. We've written some libraries. We're going to pop right over here and open up the code gen library. I know the text is hard to read. We're going to open that up and walk you through. Now, we have built RapidGen DS. We have built several libraries for SQL Server that you can just call the objects and actually build the mappings, or in this case, the views uh, from the grid. Mapping is the object that's passed into our code. This is JRuby, in case you were wondering. And in that particular case, we create a new instance of the object that generates the view, and then we build the view, return the SQL straight to the tool. So it pops up in the UI. And let's just run it. So the first thing we have to do is load a map. And again, this is source to stage. So we want to load the right map, in this particular case, stage company. So we're going to load that in and tell it to use that as a testing ground. And we're going to go ahead and generate this code. Now, the first time you ever run this, it actually takes a minute or two to load up because it's loading all the class libraries in the background. But we're going to get to that. So that the um, you can see here the output of the code generation is a pure view. And what we've created is a view for SQL Server. And we drop it first, and then we create it. And you can see here we've got the output columns from the target. Uh, notice there are no sys columns there. And then we have the functions that we've dropped in. So in this particular case, we're hashing company name. We've dropped into the function. And then we've dropped in the rest of the computation that you saw just a minute ago for the hash difference. Here's the record source, and here's the get date. Now, if you say to me, well, Dan, I, I really want alias names. I, I really don't want output names. Now, keeping in mind, this is a view. So this makes it easy to create. Uh, but you tell me you want alias names. Well, it's really simple. We've, 
we dropped a switch in here, change that 0 to a 1, and simply rerun it. From that perspective now, we have code. Instead of output names, watch this, this is magic, we've dropped the output names out of the code and we've assigned an alias to each column. So you can actually see that working out really, really well. So here we have the comp hash, and these are the target names. They don't come from the source. So we pull that right from the target, and that's how that works. So this is the code generation for source to stage for SQL Server. Next, I'm going to show you how to generate a hub and a link load. All right, for this demo, I'm going to show you how the hub and link load work for Data Vault 2.0 code generation. Again, we have to load up the map, so let's get the hub map in. And the code for Data Vault 2.0, the code itself, or the code call itself, is exactly the same. We call the same object. For Data Vault 1.0, that's going to change because in 1.0, we deal with sequence numbers. In 2.0, we deal with hashes. So you can see here, we've got a company hash, age key, load date, record source, business key, all pretty familiar stuff. Not too hard to deal with. So let's go ahead and run this. Take a look at the code that it generated. Let's put it somewhere where we can read it. You can see here again, we drop the view, create the view, and then you've got the uh, target field names from the target, and then you've got the select for the, from the source. And we bracket these table names so that it can handle spaces in accordance with SQL Server. Then from there, where the company hash is not in the target hub already. So this prevents it from loading duplicates. Let's load up the link and see what we got. And all I really need to do is change the link uh, change the mapping. So we're going to generate a link for Data Vault 2.0. Same code, right? Watch me wave my hands here. And you'll see, by the way, the, uh, the mapping name or the view name, uh, the view name is gotten from or retrieved from the mapping name itself. So you can control everything about this particular view name. Uh, I just happen to call my mappings in accordance with what I want to generate. So that makes it very easy for me to determine what it is I'm targeting. Uh, again, you can see here, load all the sources. Here's all my output fields. Here's all my source fields from the sample stage. Again, the bracketed names where the business key is not already existing in the link. And so this makes it nice and clean. Data Vault 2.0 code, especially for loading links, is extremely fast because of the switch over to hashes. We don't have to worry about sequence number joins. But that's for another day. So let's move along. And the next thing I'm going to demo for you is the satellite load code. All right, let's load up the satellite load code. That's this one here. This again is for Data Vault 2.0. And you can see here we are calling a slightly different routine. Paste that in there so you can read it. Okay. Now, the load for you is going to be slightly different as well because we're going to have an actual class file with all these objects in it. You won't be loading our Ruby scripts directly. Uh, and then from there, you simply call the creation of the object, SQL Server SAT Data Vault 2, build the view, and away we go. As I said before, this little switch over here, change it to a 1, and all of a sudden, instead of having the output field names in the, in the create view statement, the names end up as aliases on the select. So let's go ahead and pick our mapping. Again, we have to pick the satellite itself. And the satellite that we want for Data Vault 2.0 is right there. So let's load that up. Now you'll notice that we've got target primary keys mapped out, which is good. We need that for the satellite. So that's a difference. And we have everything else pretty standard. You could go ahead and put a business rule in here for load date to be set as a system column, if that's what you wanted to do on the way into the satellite. We don't have any problems with that. But you can see how quickly we can generate the code here for loading a data vault. So in this particular case, we've got a satellite, right? So there's all our target fields, hash, record source, load dates, load end dates, everything is there. And then from down there, um, we're currently working on the sequence piece. Uh, from down there, we actually uh, run a left outer join, which is equivalent to better performance. We want to make sure that what we're loading into the satellite is not already in existence. And then, and then we also want to make sure where the com company hash is null. So this is a brand new record to the satellite. Or there's a difference. The difference or hash difference is used in Data Vault 2.0. We could very well or very easily recode this to generate column compares, which we will do very shortly. However, for now, for expediency's sake, we actually uh, compare the hash difference. And we make sure that we're pulling the latest record out of the satellite 
where the hash is equal to the hash and this is the, the max load date for it so that's how that works okay so that's a left outer join against the satellite itself followed by a direct match to make sure that the satellite is bringing only the latest end date record so you can see it's very very easy to generate satellite load code right from there now you're going to say to me dan we need end dating on satellites how do we handle that well i'm going to show you in this particular code gen call we actually are doing a couple of things we're going to be fancy really fancy we're going to generate a view that pulls the data as we need it out of the satellite in order to end date it properly and then we're going to generate an end date stored prop so then we're going to tie them together okay so this is really what we're doing and it really is quite simple you don't have to do much again we're passing the mapping in to the stored procedure so we're just going to go ahead and run it whoa we got a selected mapping there look at that operator error huh okay so let's pull the satellite out again in this particular case we want to make sure that we have the end date mapping pulled because that's very special the end date mapping for the satellite only needs three fields it needs the hash on one side and the hashes on the other and it needs the end date and the load date satisfied the reason is is we're actually pulling from a view so let's go ahead and generate both of these and I'll show you the code so let's step through this so the end date process works like this create a view with those three columns that are in the end date map and then we select the company hash and then we pull a subquery now in Oracle this will change okay remember this is for SQL Server and we pull that as the end date that we need and there's a very specific way to pull these end dates out we pull two of the current records and we make sure that they're the current record now we haven't future dated if you future date it's pretty easy we'll probably add another uh, switch to flip so you can just turn it on and tell it hey future date or here's the parameter for future date and it'll generate for that for you as well after we've created the view we create a stored procedure notice that we've appended or prepended or prefixed sp underscore in Oracle again we have to watch the 30 character limit on these naming conventions so you need to be very careful on how this generation goes and yes we will be generating for Oracle here very shortly uh, so here we've got the SQL Server end date we're going to control the number of rows that actually get end dated in a single update and this is what the loop looks like this particular loop is very very efficient it's a batch style update and it'll run until all the rows that qualify have been updated in other words until it's finished so it works very very fast uh, it's very efficient and this is the code that we generate for data vault 2.0 inside of mapping manager thank you i hope you enjoyed this demo